I uh, just want to welcome everyone and, and say what a pleasure it is to, uh, to be here and um, look forward to, to hearing from uh, a really amazing panel of people speaking on the front lines of activism uh, on a lot of different issues. So with that, Wash. Okay, have the Muslim go first. I see how it is. Uh, it's fine. Uh, how's everyone doing? Thank you for that overwhelmingly enthusiastic response. I appreciate that. No, thank you. It's very warm. Sit down, ma'am. Just calm down. Just calm down. Sir, respect yourself. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm, I've been told, allegedly, I'm the last moderate Muslim on earth, uh, which is why ADL, you guys, the rabbi got that joke. Uh, <laughs> I'm an endangered species, apparently. The rest of my tribe took a magic carpet to Narnia, where there's uh, no Muslim ban. Uh, too soon or not soon enough? That's the question. Uh, and my species is eating hummus with Elvis and drinking chai tea and reading Donald Trump's taxes. But I'm the last of my species here in front of you, the ADL. So thank you for inviting me. I appreciate being here. And thank you for coming at, what is it, 8.30? What time is it? It's so early. Uh, you know, like, these are all the nerds in the room who, like, tried out for honors classes. You guys woke up to talk about social justice. Uh, it's true. I have four minutes left. I can't even say my name in four minutes, but whatever. It's fine. In uh, all honesty, uh, we were talking on the phone three, like, three days ago, and they're like, uh, Wajab, the Muslim, you go first. Like, I drew the shortest straw. So this is, I'm like the tribute for the Hunger Games. Uh, <laughs> And President, uh, President Snow Greenblatt, I hope you're merciful with me in the background. Uh, my name is Mujahat Ali. Uh, my parents chose that name so I could blend. <laughs> Believe it or not, in 2018 America, there is no keychain with my name on it. Yet. <laughs> Yet. Uh, inshallah, one day, God willing, inshallah. I have to go with Walter or Wilbur. It's like the closest that I can get to. And there's no Barack keychain either. Yet. Uh, my parents are Pakistani Muslim immigrants. Hold the applause. Yeah, thank you for that. Any, any Pakistanis here? Any Muslims? Well, that's what I thought. All right. Uh, my, uh, my parents, actually, in all seriousness, it's gotten so bad to be Pakistani Muslim in 2018 America, I'm forced to tell people I'm a pre-partition Indian who is spiritual. <laughs> Partition joke, the Jews got it. It's a good crowd. It's a good crowd. It's a good crowd. Uh, I have two and a half minutes left. We'll just keep doing this for two and a half minutes. <laughs> I grew up in Fremontistan, California, in the Bay Area. Anyone? Bay? The Bay? Right? The Bay. Um, and I was, I'm an only kid, which is very rare for brown people. We're a breeding people. I'm left-handed, which is very rare for those of you who know anything about South Asia. <laughs> left-handed people? Very, yeah, we're like jinns. They tried to change me. Did they try to change you? No, yeah, because your parents are merciful, not mine. Uh, love was very conditional in my household, so they tried to change, my, change me from left to right, didn't work. I was shy, uh, dorky, I was healthy, which is a nice way of saying big boned, which is a nice way of saying mashallah, which is a nice way of when they looked at you, they went, oh, he's, I was fat. Uh, I was so fat that the only pants I could wear growing up were husky pants. Anyone? Anyone? Who are, who are husky pants? One, two, let's do it. Three, I see a three, a four, five, five, six, so I see a seven. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 10, 11, 12, at least 15. There's at least 15 of you, us former fatties. Um, and I was also brown and Muslim, and I was the token brown guy and the token Muslim guy. Oftentimes in school, I went to an all boys Jesuit Catholic high school where I killed it every semester in religious studies classes, and the Jesuit priest used to read the highest grades, and the highest grade was Wajhatali, Kalyan Ilam Raju, the Hindu and Naveed Mustafavi, the lapsed Persian Muslim, and, and Father Allender's Jesuit heart just cracked each time. Uh, but growing up in diverse California, I was oftentimes the token representative of 1.7 billion people and 1,400 years of Islamic civilization. And on the drop of a dime, I had to be the walking Wikipedia entry on everything. Islam, Quran, Sharia, Hamas, Hamas, Fatah, Fatwa, everything, like everything. Um, and I didn't mind it because there's a great, there's a great quote from a Jewish-American uh, storyteller from the 20th century. Her, her name is Muriel Rekaiser. The quote goes, the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. I'll repeat it. The universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And if you aren't telling your story, your story is always being told to you by others. And if you aren't writing your story, your story is always being written for you by others. And oftentimes, growing up as a Muslim, as a kid of brown immigrants, 
I saw my people as the villains or the sidekicks or the footnotes. And I asked myself, is it better to be an antagonist or is it better to be invisible? Because at least the villain has some good lines. But if you're invisible, you don't exist. And I have a minute and a half left. I'll, a minute and a half, you guys with me? A minute and a half, I'll be finished in a minute and a half. You guys are okay with me? Yeah. A minute and a half, all right, I'll finish it. Um, everything was going well up until 9-11. I was a 20-year-old UC Berkeley student. Yes? And after my life, instead of joining the industry association, I joined the Muslim Student Association, where they made me a student leader. The two towers fall, and now I'm an accidental activist, and everyone's asking me to give speeches, and I'm like, I'm just trying to figure out my major. And the same walking Wikipedia entry on all things Muslimy changed because if I messed up, not only would I be indicted, but anyone who looked Muslimy and 1,400 years of Islamic civilization and 1.7 billion people would be indicted, convicted, and sentenced by a nameless judge, jury, and executioner who would always hold our loyalty and patriotism as suspect. And next thing you know, as an accidental activist, I'm now a Muslim fireman. And for the past 16 years, I'm a fireman, and I'm just like, there's so many fires. I'm exhausted. I would like to be a gardener, right? <laughs> Who, like, I have to be a janitor and a fireman. Like, can I be a gardener and plant some seeds? And now we're seeing the Trump effect, and, and I'm going to finish in the last minute. You know, when Trump was happening, people of color took him literally and seriously. We took him literally and seriously. And I used to tell people, I was invited to uh, a Jewish American synagogue, and they told me, this was right before he, was, he clinched the nomination, they said, you're the first Muslim we're ever inviting. We're liberal on everything except, and I'm like, let me guess, Muslims, Israel, Palestine. And the rabbi's like, yeah. Uh, and, th and then he said, good luck. And I'm like, what? And then he invited me on stage. <laughs> True story. Uh, and I remember I told the audience at that time, I said, Trump went after undocumented immigrants. Then he went after Muslims. He just went after blacks. Who is he going to go after next? And this is what the audience did. I'm like, yep, because that's never late in America. And what we're seeing now is exhaustion, right? And I have two babies. And who here has babies or is a young parent? All right. Ibrahim and Nuseba. They thankfully look like their mom. Very cute. Uh, but just to show you how this affects people, I have parents around my age, born and raised in America, who are self-policing their children's names. Muslim Americans saying, maybe we should name our kid Adam, but white people think it's Adam. So there's like a billion Adams, Ryans, Ryans, Laylas, and Sophias that have been born in the past four years, right? Because people are self-policing their kids' names. Just think about that for a second. And I said, I'm not going to go out like that, which is fine if you do, where parents would protect our kids. I named my child Ibrahim, after Abraham, uh, specifically because there's a beautiful verse in the Quran where God commands the fires to be cooled for Abraham. It's also in the Old Testament. And, and the name of my son was a prayer for that generation, because I said, may the fires of this world be cooled by and for the Abrahams, the Abrahams of our youth, the next generation. And my daughter is named Nuseba, and she's like this warrior princess badass in Islamic history. And I'm like, dude, I don't have time for damsels in distress, all right? She needs to save my butt. <laughs> She needs to save me. I don't have time for these Disney princess like damsel in distresses. Nuseba, pick yourself up and kick ass. Throw down. Ain't gonna be no me too. Time's up for you and your generation. Time is up. Win. Um, and the final thing I will say is, and thank you for the panelists for giving me your time. Final thing I will say is this. There's a great uh, hadith, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam that says, even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant a seed. Even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant a seed. I can say this because I'm not ADL and not a nonprofit. But for many of us, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse is an orange, thin skinned, venal, uh, incompetent man with yellow hair. But our faith commands hope. Apathy and cynicism is cheap and lazy, it means being a spectator. But having hope means exposing yourself to failure and pain and being a participant in the ring. And there are many troubles, but I would say the following, there's a positive in this crisis, is we've seen an emergence of the multicultural coalition of the willing, what I call the ethnic Avengers. <laughs> Men and women, or if you're a DC fan, the Justice League. Uh, let's stick with Avengers. Uh, but we're seeing men and women who realize we have to carry each other's waters, and tribal absolutism will not work, because white supremacy is a hell of a drug, and it's coming after all of us. 
and we have to combine our powers together so that all of our kids can be the co-protagonists of the American narrative. Thank you for your time. But my name is Lacey Schwartz, and I'm a filmmaker and a storyteller, and I do community outreach as well around the work that I do. Most relevantly to kind of this room is I've been working for over a decade with an organization called Behola Shon that works around racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity in the Jewish community. And I think as many of us who have decided to show up this morning understand that there is a lot of work that needs to be done to change the norms and our institutions to be able to protect all people more. Um, and the work I do, I kind of look at it as this idea of big A advocacy, kind of the big issues, really fighting the fight in the big rooms. But also as a storyteller, I also very much focus on what we consider to be little a advocacy. Because many of us are walking in every day to these rooms carrying our own stories and our own experiences that are informing how we are interacting with the world. And that's what I'd really love to talk about today is about what more we can do as individuals to really be accountable to the society that we live in. And I'd love to share a little bit of my story, which is um, I grew up in upstate New York. In represents, <laughs> specifically in Woodstock, New York, although I live in Rhinebeck now, for those of you who might know it, um, in a white Jewish family with two white Jewish parents. Mm -hmm. And my story is that I found out at the age of 18 that my biological father was black. And the story is, and I, is that my mother had an affair and no one talked about it. Mm -hmm. And I made a personal documentary called Little White Lie about family secrets and dual identity, in which I went back and I explored how that happened and how family secrets can be so powerful within our lives and within our communities. But really, for me, the pivotal moment was that I actually lived from the time I was 18 until I was around 28 in what I consider to be a racial closet. I actually went to school, to undergrad at, at Georgetown, I was in DC, and um, then it was in New York, I went to law school at Harvard, so I was up and down the Eastern Seaboard, and when I would go home, I would kind of whitewash my world. And I wouldn't really talk about my identity with anybody except for my mother. But what was happening during that period of time for myself is that I had grown up very much in a white, Jewish, New York, Ashkenazi family where without even explicitly saying it, we really, for me, being Jewish was synonymous with being white. Mm. And one year in my mid-20s, there was like a hurricane or something. I was living in New York City and I couldn't go home for Yom Kippur. And so I went to a synagogue in the neighborhood I was living in in Brooklyn. And there was a kid around my age who came up to me and he was just visibly, by looking, at, by looking at him, I could tell that he had two kind of black identified American parents. He was really friendly and he said, this is my synagogue, you know, my, you know, my family has been involved in the synagogue for many generations. And I was looking at him and after years of being questioned so deeply about what I was, and how I was Jewish, I looked at this kid and I realized I had no idea how he was Jewish. I, my own Jewish quote unquote education, which was 12 million years of Hebrew school, like many of us, um, <laughs> did not include this kid's story. Mm. And I was staring at him and thinking I would love to know his story, but because I had been questioned so much in my life, I didn't ask it. Mm. I walked away from that, and I, but I walked away realizing that I was ignorant that even though day in and day out, I was dealing with people questioning me, and I was coming from kind of a very mixed background, that I myself did not understand the story of my own people. And so I took it upon myself at that moment. That was a huge turning point for me, and a huge moment of accountability when I realized that I was uninformed about the Jewish people and the Jewish story. And I took it upon myself to educate myself, to read books, to understand and to actually then go out and share my own story and really learn and humble myself to the fact that just because I had my own story that I was not in fact informed with other people's stories as well. And I bring that to you today because I think in this moment is a moment where there's a lot of, as I just referred to, there's a lot of triggers out there right now and it feels a lot of times like a lot of people are attacking us. But the question I would really ask us is like, what are we doing in this moment to be accountable? You know, in particular, when it comes to race, when you look at your own personal life, when you have a barbecue, is if you believe in racial integration, 
If you believe that all people are equal, is that what your life looks like? Do you send your kids to racially integrated schools? Within those schools, are the honors classes actually integrated or is there in fact segregation within those actual schools? You know, those are the questions that each and every one of us has to ask ourselves. I think by showing up today, I think you are all dedicating yourselves to the, doing the work. But the question I think for really for civil rights in our time is are we going to be accountable to making the personal changes in our lives as well and not just pointing fingers at other people but asking ourselves what do we have to do to challenge bias, norms around gender, around race, around sexuality, around religion, that so often we have internalized, no matter what we look like, we still, as Waj said, I totally agree, white supremacy is an incredible drug and every single one of us has been inflicted by it. And so are we going to do the work to fundamentally be accountable and make those changes both in small and large ways in our lives? And if we can do that, um, I love the Margaret Mead quote when I came down the escalator today walking in. If we can do that, if every one of us can really hold ourselves accountable and say we have more work to do, not just within the big institutions but in our own personal lives, I think we can see an incredible difference. So thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. So I want to get your juices flowing. I want to do something different. I'm not going to be as humorous as Rajaj was. This is why I said during the conference call, he should start it off with the humor. And he did an excellent job in doing so. So I first want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I love you, I appreciate you, and I need you to survive. I kind of like you. I, have I somewhat tolerate you. <laughs> and your survival is eh. We all say I love you differently. <laughs> it's a very Jewish way of saying I love you. You know my parents. Yeah. yeah. I said, I kind of like you. I only kind of like myself. <laughs> okay, okay. It depends honestly. the day. <laughs> I, know, I knew that was a trap. I know people are going to have a little extra dialogue. Um, I wanted to start off that way because I believe that love is one of the most powerful forces on, on this planet, and I believe that it can overcome any amount of hate or any amount of fear. So we need to understand that. So I'm going to do a quick exercise to get your juices flowing. I want everybody to stand up. That was great. Please. Now, I want you to look around the room, and I want you to look around the room, right? It's a lot of people. So now I want this side to sit down. You guys can sit down. Too. No. <laughs> Thank you. And this now to sit down, please. So, when everyone stood up, you represented the U.S. population, right? In the middle right here is a representation of the over 70 million Americans who are walking around with a criminal conviction. So look, mm. look around. Mm. Look at them. Looks like a lot of people, right? Mm. So you can sit down now. <laughs> so now, I'm Roy Waterman, as you might have read on the app or in your uh, program. I'm the Criminal Justice Project Manager for an organization called the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. And my role is to educate the Jewish community about mass incarceration, criminal justice reform, as well as bridge the gap between the Jewish community and communities of color. How do we work together? Now, I always say this, and this is key, and that is the Jewish community has to be comfortable with being uncomfortable when it comes to this topic. So I, I do a lot of parallels when it comes to talking about slave, uh, mass incarceration and how it's just a manifestation of slavery and also the trauma that's associated with slavery a, as a whole. But what I also bring up as well, which people don't always like, especially from the Jewish community, I talk about the Holocaust. I talk about like the trauma that's associated with the Holocaust, like the survivor stuff, the, like everything that was associated with the Holocaust. And there's no comparison because we're not comparing the two. But what we're saying is trauma is trauma. Hurt people hurt people. And we all need healing. We all need restoration, right? When you get locked up or when you go to jail or prison, you're given a, a number. The Jewish community can identify with numbers. 
You know what it's like to be marginalized. You know what it's like to be segregated against. And that's what happens when you go to prison. So I'm a chef, and I love talking about food. Um, and I believe that food has the uncanny ability of bringing fa friends, family, and even enemies together, right? There's a lot of power in a shared meal. So I, I come to this work because I realized from a very early age, watching my mother and my grandmother, that food has the uncanny ability of making people happy when it's good and making people mad when it's bad. <laughs> so in watching that, uh, I, I learned that food was like the ultimate unifier. It's the one thing we all have in common, no matter what we do, we all have to eat. Mm -hmm. No matter what your political views are, no matter what your disagreements are, no matter what your religion is, we all have to consume food to survive, right? So I come to this work at JCPA, which is a nonprofit organization. So that means we are like, we accept donations. <laughs> Jewish Council for Public Affairs.org. Shameless plug, but uh, I come to this work as not just as a chef or a paralegal or a person that's an advocate or activist. I come to this work as a formerly incarcerated man as well. So I spent almost 13 years in prison. So from the age 19 to the age of 32, I was incarcerated in state and federal prison. So I know what it's like to get arrested, incarcerated for crimes I did. And I know what it's like to like, lack purpose, direction, and focus in being incarcerated. But I also know what it's like to find myself while I was incarcerated. One of the things that helped me strengthen myself, my views, were taking therapeutic programs, reading a lot of self-help books. But also, more importantly, I discovered the power of education when I was in a prison cell in Clinton, Dannemora, upstate New York. Like, it allowed me to see that my life or my, my existence was so much bigger than my eight block radius of where I grew up in Queens, New York, right? Education has a, a, a canny ability of removing barriers and showing you the world from a, from a 30,000 feet perspective versus the 3,000 feet perspective where I was living at on a regular basis. So in returning back into society, I faced barriers and challenges. Barriers to housing, barriers to employment, barriers to higher education, why? Because I had to check, yes, I've been convicted of a felony. So no matter how much good I do in this world, I still am going to be labeled if I do something wrong tomorrow or today, the headlines are going to read what? Felon, ex-con. So I'm big on language, and there's one thing we all can do in this room is check our language at the door. And what I mean by that is this. We have to hold ourselves accountable for the language we're using when we're describing people who are justice impacted or formerly incarcerated. Notice the language I'm using. Justice impacted and formerly incarcerated. I didn't use felon, ex-con, murderer, pedophile. I didn't use a label. And you know why I didn't use a label? Because it's so much easier for you to discard me when you're able to look at me as an object. But if you look at me as Roy, the, 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 the son, Roy, the brother, Roy, the husband, then there's going to be a level of humanity there, right? A humility as well, and dignity. But if you look at me as the bank robber, the murderer, then you're going to look at me a whole lot different, and it's easier for you to discard me as a human being. And that's what I'm saying about our current criminal justice system. It is, I always say the system is not broken. It's is working perfectly well, and we have to understand that. A lot of people like to use the term, the system is broken. This system of oppression is built on institutional racism, and it's not broken. It's working perfectly fine to the white men who built it many moons ago. So now, so now us understanding that the system is not broken and it's working perfectly fine, then we have to reimagine what it looks like to be incarcerated in America or be held accountable. I believe in public safety. I believe the need for, um, you know, like law and order. Uh, I believe people should be held accountable, but I believe our current system, what it's doing is tearing people apart on a daily basis and it's making people even worse than what they were before they even went in. So I am who I am today as an activist, a chef, an entrepreneur, um, a criminal justice project manager for JCPA, in spite of my prison experience, right? And I discovered the, the power of therapy and counseling, and I always tell people, you don't only have to be in, formally incarcerated to have therapy and counseling, we all need it. 
We all need it. We need someone that's completely objective, that is not a family member, a spouse, to pour out all the things we're going through so that they can process it and they won't judge you. And then they'll say to you, guess what? You're not crazy. You've just been through some stuff and I'm gonna help you navigate through that stuff. And what I'm saying to you is, as the position I'm in with the Jewish Council for Public Affairs as I wrap up, mass incarceration is impacting so many people, 2.3 million Americans, 70 million walking around, 9 million people being released from jails and prisons every year, 450,000 people on supervised release, parole or probation. Whether you believe it or not, this is the issue that impacts you. And I know a lot of people like to think, oh, not in my neighborhood. But guess what? One out of every three black men you see have a criminal record. One out of every six Latino men have a criminal record. That is something that is a public health crisis, and, and my organization, the Jewish Council of Public Affairs, is now involved with this work because this is the Jewish community's re-engagement with the modern-day civil rights movement, which is the end mass incarceration. <laughs> in, closing, in closing, I'll say this, because I'm big on healing and restoring. It's very hard and very difficult to heal from something that continues to happen to you every day. And I'll say that again. It's very hard and difficult to heal from something that continues to impact you every day. And that's what mass incarceration is to people of color in America. It is the, it is the manifestation of slavery. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mara Kiesling. I'm the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality. Uh, I am so honored to be here, and I am particularly honored and, and fortified for listening to the folks who spoke already. Uh, you know, people always ask me what they should do to help my cause or any cause, and I always say, figure out what your superpower is and then apply it. And we just saw people using superpowers of humor, of storytelling, and I, I just think it's so amazing. And you're all today using the superpower of being together, and that's wonderful. You know, trans people, uh, transgender people, um, for our purposes, we'll use that kind of interchangeably, um, are in a tough spot right now. We are under attack everywhere. Um, I, I like Waj's uh, analogy of being a fireman. Uh, that's what I feel like uh, a lot of times. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to um, tell you about two political philosophers I know. Uh, one is the Dalai Lama, who once said, if you want other people to be happy, practice compassion. But if you want yourself to be happy, practice compassion. <laughs> or as the other great political philosopher, Melania Trump, said, <laughs> I want to get this right. The world is getting too mean and too, or too rough. Now, I think she's right. The world is getting too mean and too tough, and there isn't uh, compassion. Um, where, where I sit in my activism, really ensconced in the left, um, we're forgetting about compassion and love. Uh, and that's really easy to do. The trauma is very real. The attacks are very real. Um, there is a body count. Um, our children, as trans children, are, are terrified. Uh, Muslim children are terrified. Immigrant children are terrified. People whose parents are incarcerated are terrified. Um, and if we can't have compassion for kids, I think we ought to be rethinking our society a little bit. But I want to talk just briefly, briefly about um, uh, President Trump. Uh, I'm not really going to speak about President Trump hardly at all, other than to say that people keep asking me, probably the biggest question I get from, from trans people or from other people is, how are you carrying on? Isn't this disheartening? Isn't this bad? And, um, and yeah, as I said, there's a body count. Um, you know, when, when they, one of the things they're doing right now in the, in the federal government is they're trying to eliminate the federal regulations that say transgender people can't be discriminated against in health care. I mean, for gosh sakes, that, that is just outrageous and it will cause people to die. And the, and the right wing is attacking trans people all the time because they think we're weak, they think we're a small population, and they think we're alone. 
Um, they're wrong on two of the three counts. We are, in fact, a small population, probably about half of a percent. Um, but we are not weak, um, and we are definitely not alone. But there... <laughs> There are things besides the Trump administration and the, the right wing using us now that they've lost marriage equality, though they don't think they've lost marriage equality. They're still fighting that. We've seen 10 states in the last two years um, uh, pass laws that, dis, that allow adoption agencies to not adopt to LGBT parents. Um, it's a, a really dangerous thing that I don't think we've been talking loud enough yet. But there are other dangerous things that I just want to flag. And, and when I'm on the front lines, I, the topic of today was being on the front lines um, uh, of, of uh, social justice movements. And there's a lot we're facing besides Trump. We're facing uh, the fact that just as LGBT people and transgender people are really gaining power in institutions, institutions are disappearing and disintegrating and weakening. Um, and, and we're all doing that. We're facing horizontal hostility. Um, in the trans community, in the LGBT community, in the larger progressive community. Um, we're facing something, I think, internally and externally with other people and in our own selves that, that we're facing an almost cult-like moral certainty and everything becomes a moral question and every tiny disagreement with people or a people um, is condemned on, on moral grounds. And I think one of the things that I'm struggling with most in my community uh, is an inexperience with the long game and a lack of trust in the long game. Uh, I realized the other day, I, I saw a 20-something talk about the trend line, and the trend line in trans policy is, is going sharply down right now because of the administration, what's happening in several states. There's still some really good things happening. I mean, most people in America must be wondering, where the heck did all these transgender people come from all the time, all of a sudden? But I see the trend line, and I see it all the way back uh, to maybe 1900, and how it was nothing, and it was nothing, and it was nothing. Then the internet was invented, and we were able to form community, and we were able to build a community. And then the Obama administration happened, and we were able to get some amazing policy done. We cataloged 165 administrative policy victories during the Obama administration, and I see that. So that little, that little thing down there, that's just a little down blip. Um, we're going to win, and we're going to get past that. Um, but here's, here's what we have. We are stronger every time President Trump attacks us. When he told transgender people they can't serve in the military, we turned that tragedy into a tragedy with a strong educational component. And he looked bad. We looked good. We got stronger. He got weaker. When they took away our education Title IX guidance um, and said schools didn't necessarily have to, you know, the government wouldn't act if schools didn't treat transgender students right, people got that. And we got stronger and he got weaker and we will win that back. Um, we have that all on our side and we have more and more trans people coming up all the time. When I was coming up, I was the only transgender person in the whole world. Um, <laughs> I mean, I really thought that. You will hear trans people, particularly of my age, um, say that. Um, but we have all of that. And we, we also have a growing sense of solidarity in, in, in Washington and in the left that I think is really helpful. Um, we did a survey of 28,000 transgender people recently, and we saw that 23% of our sample did not get medical treatment sometime last year when they needed it because they were afraid of being disrespected. But 33% did not seek medical treatment because they couldn't afford it. Sometimes when you're transgender, the biggest transgender issue you're facing is poverty. Sometimes the biggest transgender issue you're facing is racism. Sometimes the biggest transgender issue you're facing is that you're uh, formerly incarcerated, or that you have a disability and you can't have access to a place. We understand that as a trans movement. We understand that we can't be a moral movement and we can't even be an effective movement unless we are an anti-racist movement, a pro-disability rights movement, a pro-immigrant movement, a pro-woman movement, a pro-worker movement.
And we have to be fighting anti-Semitism. We have to be fighting it on the right. We have to be fighting it on the left, which I never thought I would have to say. But I want, in general, I want us to be better about it. I want us to be nicer about it. I want us to have more compassion about it. Um, I was asked by a, a United States senator, um, or her comp, she said, I hope trans people know they can weather this storm. And I don't know what got into me at that second, but I said, I'm gonna have to swear, I'm sorry, because it's what I did at the time, but I said, um, Senator, we'll be all right. We are the storm. <laughs> but I believe that. I believe trans people haven't come this far to only come this far. But I believe while we're out there slaying the, the dragon that's holding the little $5 umbrella up trying to keep the storm out, um, that we have to understand compassion and we have to understand love and we have to understand that we all created the dragon. We all created these problems we have. It isn't us versus them. It will never work by us saying they messed it up and we're going to make them pay for it. That doesn't help us. We need to get together. We need everybody to get together. We need to show compassion for each other. We need to understand the long game. And gosh, we need our superpowers right now. So figure out what yours is and, and get to the front lines. We really need you. Thank you so much. Uh, and just to kick it off, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how, how I can moderate uh, a panel of really amazing um, stories and activists. Uh, in no small part because I think as the, the white Ashkenazi Jewish kid from Chicago, I was kind of the, the, the stand-in for the ADL everyman. Um, Some of our favorite <laughs> friends are the white Ashkenazi Jews. Yeah. <laughs> Some of my best friends are the white Ashkenazi Jews. Most of us are not even sure if we like ourselves. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's part of, the, uh, it's part of our charm. Um, but my mind kept turning again and again to this famous quote by Martin Luther King where he says, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Mm. We're all tied up in this web of mutuality, mm. a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Um, or as you put it, we're in this kind of ethnic uh, Avenger League. Um, uh, so my question is, <coughs> you know, in a system that wants to divide us all um, and wants to keep us separate, uh, and wants to keep us from being allies. How can we as a community um, best be allies when the, the, the concept of allyship itself is disputed, right? People don't often know where, where to start. So for the people in the audience um, or for the other Ashkenazi kids from Chicago, um, how can we help? Uh, so I will, I'll jump in, I guess. Uh, so how the Jewish community can help as a whole in ADL is when you're framing conversations about any specific group or, or, or demographic of people, they should be leading the conversations, right? I think that for a long time, there's been people who like created movements, but they didn't include those who were impacted the most, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have, when it comes to incarceration, you can't formulate a conversation or be involved with bail reform or like re, uh, restoration of rights or, or um, speedy trial or whatever it is, prison conditions if you don't have the feedback and the input from people who are formerly incarcerated. We need to have people who are formerly incarcerated to be a part of those conversations. If not, more, most of the time, I would say, go as far as saying leading those conversations. Because for a long time, there were people that didn't look like me that were always telling me what was best for me to do when I come home from prison, despite the fact that they've never been to prison, despite the fact that they've never come home from prison. Mm. And I'll say this in closing, there's one thing that's very key. Uh, that's that old saying that blacks were promised 40 acres and a mule, if you've ever heard that. Well, when you come home from New York State Prison, you know what they give you? They give you $40 and a bus ticket. Mm. I would push back on the concept of allyship in general. I mean, it's a term that kind of gets my gourds sometimes. I think that, you know, I had, um, in the summer of 2016, it was a particularly hard week I have, um, twin boys who are now four and a half, and um, my husband's black, you know, they're little brown boys in America. And 
in July, of, I think it was July of 2016, in one week, both Alton Sterling and Philando Castile were killed. And it was a really, really hard week. Um, really brutal filmed incidents of police brutality. And I mean, I was really feeling it. And what really got to me though, is both family members and friends, and even at one point a doctor said to me, I can't imagine how this is for you right now. Mm. Having two brown, you know, raising two brown boys. And, it, and I just wanted to, to say to them, why can't you understand it? Mm. Like, these are our children. These are our citizens. Like, why can't you understand it? And I think if you're looking at situations that are happening, if you're looking at people getting locked up, if you're looking at people getting killed, if you're looking at people whose rights are getting taken away, and you look at them and you pity them, or you sympathize with them, but you can't empathize with them, I think you have to really ask yourself what it is. So I push back on the idea of being allies, and I push back on putting ourselves in really situations where, you know, for me, in terms of the work that I do in many different spaces, um, I'm fighting for all children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not just fighting for my children, I'm fighting for all children to have rights. And if my children, you know, I come from a certain background, and. I have been very blessed to have a certain education, but I'm you know, back home fighting that fight and really wanting to make sure that all children have access because if my children get a good education, but a kid down the block does not, or a kid you know, across the country does not, what is that going to do for my children's generation? I think we all have to push ourselves to not be allies, but actually to really feel it on a deep level that this is our society and our community. And in particular, you know, I do that work around the Jewish people as well, where it's really about this idea of a global Jewish peoplehood. It's not about learning about somebody else. It's about understanding that that is part of who you are as well. You guys want real talk? Yeah. All right. So if you want real talk, just bear with me for a moment. Uh, there's a perception, I'm saying perception, among many American Muslim communities that the, the rise of American Muslim communities, the empowerment of American Muslim communities, uh, is seen as a threat to some of the Ashkenazi good old boy Jews from Chicago. And as such, when you look at different sectors of America, you see footprints and funding from certain groups and sources, not all, where directly it's tied from the Jewish American community that wants to stamp out American Muslims, primarily over one issue. Anyone want to take a guess? Israel, Israel Palestine, right? They're rampaging elephant in the room, and then tribal politics come out, and everyone goes in their absolutist shells and cocoons, and it becomes a zero-sum game us versus them, it's all about survival and security, and if they rise, it'll come at our expense, so we have to crush them before they crush us, and then we have litmus tests, and before we can talk to each other, you have to check off the boxes of the seven litmus tests to see how you can engage each other before engaging each other, and then if you have six of the seven boxes checked but not one, then you have to check that box, and now six years have passed, you still haven't talked, and Donald Trump's elected. <laughs> um, I'm keeping it real, and there, is massive tension between Muslim and Jewish organizations and community members, and a lot of pain, a lot of mistrust, primarily around this issue that then infects a lot of the shared values and a lot of the uh, allyship, if you don't like allyship, Muslim Justice League, ju you know, a, a Semitic Justice League that can create around these shared values, it gets disrupted because of this. And so what I would recommend people doing is what I'm doing today. I was telling Jonathan, Sheikh Jonathan, uh, <laughs> I got a lot of heat for coming here today. A lot of heat. We could talk about it afterwards. And a lot of Muslims feel very betrayed that I'm here, pained. How can you go to the ADL? Do you know what they've done to us in the past? How can you go to the ADL? They've created lists about us. How do you go to the ADL? Look what they've said. And I said, listen, and I agree with Mara, I'm so glad you said what you said, is this, this tribal absolutism will destroy us. Mm. And the only way, <laughs> and everything, you know, I said everything you guys tweet or Facebook post, and I'll give credit to Jonathan, I say directly to Jonathan's face, and to his credit, he asks me, where have I gone wrong? What can I do better? Doesn't mean it always works, and, I, and Jonathan just got like minus 5,000 friends right now. <laughs> Basically, we were at Aspen together, and we, comp uh, we did a fatwa off, we took a photo together, and we're like, who gets more fatwas? And, like, and so we looked at our Twitter screen, and I'm like, all right, I got 18 Muslims who hate me. He goes, I got 22 Jews who hate me. I'm like, ah, you won this time. You won this time. <laughs> Uh, but specifically, what I would ask you to do, <laughs> Muslims look to Jews and we, in, a, in a strange aspirational way, because Muslims, especially immigrants and African Americans who've been in this country for 400 years, they're like, we know what Jews went through. We know. Jews had to do their own uh, Jewish clubs because you guys weren't allowed in. You guys had to change your names 
and even then they said, ah, but he's Jewish. You guys weren't able to go into law schools. Uh, every single talking point against Muslims that has been used by Donald Trump replaced Muslim with Jew, exactly what was happening in America in the 30s and 40s. Replaced with Catholics, exactly what was happening in the 50s and 60s. And so for Muslims, we're like, dude, Jews get it. And if there's any group that gets it, even on a religious level, uh, circumcision, kosher, halal, hello, who gets it? <laughs> Jews. And so there are shared values here, and what I would recommend Muslims and Jews do, and this, you're gonna get a lot of heat from your communities, but think about the future in the long-term game. Get out of your culturally isolated cocoon, disrupt your comfort, and lean into the other group and say, listen, we will have disagreements, let's talk. And you're gonna get hit, but is it worth it for our future of children? I say yes. <laughs> Sorry for taking some time. Never speak after wash. <laughs> <laughs> I, I completely agree with everything all three folks say, um, completely. This yeah. is the best panel you're going to have at ADL, by the way. I'm just telling you. That. Uh, let me ask uh, one one question to conclude too, because it, you know it seems to me when we're talking about um, you know activists and civil rights movement in the last civil rights movement, there were there were clear leaders, right? There's Martin Luther King, Cesar Chavez, uh, Rabbi Heschel. You know, in this movement, you know, one of the things I think in part because of the internet, it's not clear who's in charge. And there's, there's opportunities and there's challenges mm. that, come, that come from that. Um, so, you know, in the absence of, and I think one of the things that's happening is that you have this great sorting out of, of people going, well, you can't say that because, you know, there's a kind of a self-policing when you don't have someone in charge. So, you know, how can we tap into movements that are diffuse? You know, obviously we can get into to any movement we want, but, you know, how should we think about that? Or how do you guys think about that in your work as leaders? Mm. I'll, I'll start. It's it's really tough. Um, yeah. There is a, a weakening of the system of organizations even. Um, sometimes being in an organization is suspect. Uh, and the unfortunate, it, there's an effectiveness cost. I mean, it, it, it can also help effectiveness where everybody can suddenly speak up. But the cacophony that's created and the quick condemnation and calling out people yeah. tends to eliminate moderation. Um, and I mean moderation in the effective sense. Right. So you can get, uh, I made the mistake in print uh, about two years ago of saying incrementalism is how policy gets done while people are whining about incrementalism. <laughs> now from a policy point of view, I am exactly correct there. Apparently saying that your community is whining is a bad thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, um, it may have seemed like I was whining, by the way, which I was. I, so I, I, think, um, I, I think it's really tough. And we don't, uh, you know, as one of the bigger trans organizations, we have no, and it's okay, but we have no control over virtually anything but what we do and say. And even that, we are held to such an accountability standard by about 10 million people who the only accountability they have is to themselves, and that's probably appropriate, but it's really hard. And please don't tweet the whining thing. <laughs> I could beat Jonathan's 22 easily. With that. I, th I think you have to have, sh what are your values? What are your principles? Are you willing to be consistent? Are you willing to stand up for it? Are you willing to take the arrows and the tweets and the subtweets and the Facebook posts? Uh, are you willing to find allies around shared values and then model that behavior? And at the end of the day, that's the best you can do in this day and age where it's the wild, wild west, right? And you have to be prepared, and I think we all said this before, you gotta have some tough skin. Mm -hmm. uh, be prepared, shut up or sit up. Uh, sit, shut up or sit, shut up or <laughs> sit down. Shut up or sit, I, that's, my first language was not English, so. <laughs> Uh, seriously, I was born and raised in this country. My first language was Urdu. I went to ESL, but then I ended up graduating with an English major. So hashtag it gets better. Uh, but, but that's why I said, tell people, right? Because you get hit from so many different sides. You have to keep focused with the mission. Keep moving forward. Do the best that you can. Learn. And then what I'll also say is, and I'm so glad you said this, we have to care about everyone's babies, not just our own. 
brown babies, black babies, immigrant babies, undocumented babies, LGBT babies, cute babies, the not so cute babies. Uh, you have to model that type of behavior. And at the end of the day, let me be Muslimy, if I may, for a second. We will only be judged for our own intentions and actions. And at the end of the day, you can be the best version of yourself and model the type of America through your daily actions you want this country to become.